are the gas companies leasing all of the mineral rights or just the gas rights? That's a question that kind of departs from our discussion of the Dormant Mineral Interest Act, but I, I'll, I'll answer that one because I can do so generally. You've got to read the lease that you're presented. The leases say different things, and whatever the lease says controls that legal obligation. So if it, if it simply says gas, that's what it means. If it says gas, oil, hydrocarbons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then it's going to include, include all of those things. Typically, when it comes to leasing, the gas companies aren't interested in the coal. So you're not seeing a lot of that sort of all minerals, whatever they may be, but you are seeing a longer list of substances other than just simply gas. Yes, sir. Uh, if I understood you said the person filing the claim has to determine if the person who holds the mineral rights still exists. Yes, the, the surface owner who files this action has an obligation to try to ascertain the mineral interest owner. Okay, in, in my case, and there will be about 25 of us, bought state property. It was all owned by a Mr. Strickland. Give to state in 1929. You need to have five people going to Marietta High looking for family members. There, there so, is, excuse me. The question is about property that was bought that had been owned by the state, and the state was donated. It was donated by Mr. Strickland out in Ohio. Does he have to go look for all the heirs of this Mr. Strickland? Well, no, does everyone individually have to go? Oh, individually, do all the people that bought off this property need to go look? Technically, yes, but if you if you know that you own a portion of a larger tract that sort of is experiencing the same challenges, it makes sense for all of you to sort of band together and take care, take advantage of those economies of scale, uh, if you will, and, and trying to ascertain that information and to some extent filing the action. Second question: Will the, will it be one trust that handles all these different, or is there going to be a trust for? Me at Swanton and someone Pleasant Valley, is that going to be a separate trust? A the, separate trust fee? There'll be a separate trust and a separate trust created for each action. Yes. Chris, on your fact sheet, the last note under activity, it says activity does not, does not constitute injection of substances for the purpose of disposal or storage. Could you speak to that a bit? Sure. One would think that when we talk about all these different incidences that constitute a use, that gas storage, in other words, taking gas that didn't originate from that formation and injecting it or pumping it back into that formation for purposes of storing it, which in the accident area, many of you are familiar with the gas storage fields that are there, you would think that that would constitute a use, uh, but it doesn't. And so under the statute, having storage or injection on your property would not constitute a use that would prevent you from needing to have to file and uh, a notice. So you should still file a notice, even if you've got had that activity. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a scenario where I have some property that's been subdivided out of large, larger parcels <coughs> in the past. And I noticed, I searched the records back into the 1970s, early 1970s, the gas rights were severed with a five-year lease to a gas company. And from that time on, I see nothing. So when that five-year lease was up, it, uh, what, what happens at that point? Let me clarify one thing. You, you, you make the comment that you found a 1970 lease that has a five-year term that severed the gas. That lease did not sever the gas. The gas is severed when ownership of the gas is actually transferred to another party. That constitutes a severance. For instance, if I own a house and I lease it to you for the summer, I've not conveyed it to you, I've merely leased it to you for that period of time. I still own it subject to your lease. Okay. So that would be the same with the gas. If the gas is under lease, it's not been severed. The owner still owns it, it's just subject to that, that lease or the terms of that lease. So when you look at that 1970s lease and it has a five-year term, chances are it says this lease is for five years or for so long thereafter as production 
is going on. Now, production has a very broad definition in many leases. It could be anything as simple as doing initial surveying or seismic testing to the extent of actually having a well on the property. So when you look at that lease and it says a five-year term, that lease ended after the five-year term unless there was some incident of production ongoing that would have extended that term longer. Okay. So that would go with a 20-year dormant <coughs> if nothing's been done, no drilling, no... Right, if, if nothing else has happened in 20 years, then it, it's, uh, that, there's nothing in that record that constitutes use. Okay. Yes, sir. In a deed, the word fee simple, what does that mean? What, what is it here? The definition of the term fee simple in a deed. <coughs> the definition of the term fee simple is not going to answer the question of whether or not you own the mineral rights under your property. Uh, the idea of owning something in fee uh, traditionally has meant that, that you own the whole, but that terminology in your modern deed is not going to tell you uh, in and of itself whether you own the minerals or not. Suppose you find nothing where in any deeds where it's been withheld. If you search your chain of title thoroughly and there has been no reservation in your chain of title of minerals, then you own the minerals. Yes? That's a good question. That arises out of the legal action. Let's, excuse me, Chris, let's oh, restate it because I had a hard time okay. hearing that. I think it's after the formation of the trust, how, is the, or how are the rights actually conveyed? The court will actually order the trustee to convey those interests to the surface owner as part of that entire cause of action. Um, it occurs by petition and then once all of the uh, requirements of the trust have been met and the time periods have been met, then upon motion of the surface owner, uh, the judge will order that to occur. So there's, there's not another long lengthy court situation in there once those things have been met? It, it will be done under the auspices of the original legal cause of action. Thank you. Although it will require its own affirmative pleading in that action. Yes. Chris, uh, for a farmer to protect the <clears throat> title of minerals, now assuming that the mineral owner fails to do <coughs> the following prior to October of this year, and the service owner then files for an action in the court, what is the likelihood <coughs> The question is, what are the chances that after October 1st, 2011, that the, um, if, if the farmer files to regain the rights, what are the chances that the mineral rights owner will prevail um, in light of the fact of the cost that the farmer has incurred? That, that's a little bit of a crystal ball question. Um, but the, the, the mineral owner can come forward at that point under certain circumstances, even after October 1st, 2011, to be able to claim those rights. So it can happen. Is there a notice given some way once the uh, property files that and it goes into a trust, is, it, is there any attempt by court, whoever, mm -hmm. to contact that possible mineral owner or is notice given to them? Is it required? 
public notice is given um, and there's also that affirmative duty to try to locate that person and give them actual notice. So, I, I hope everyone heard that question. Yes, I'm a surface owner. My neighbor owns the metal rights. He signed the lease and it will start drilling this spring. Now, what way can I protect myself now and in the future, say they ruin my drinking water? Is there some way I can have a litigation suit against this? Uh, I guess it's a cheap company. Is there some way I can protect myself now and in the future if they would ruin my drinking water? Because my neighbor, he owns the metal rights. I the gentleman owns his surface rights, his neighbor <coughs> owns the mineral rights and has signed a lease and they're anticipating um, drilling soon and he's wondering how he can protect himself and in particular his drinking supply. And, and I'm going to say with all respect that that exceeds the scope of the issue tonight with the Dormant Mineral Interest Act. That's probably an entire evening presentation in and of itself. So. I don't own the mineral rights. My neighbor does. He signed the lease. So but where does that leave me? You, know. you, you, are, you are not a surface owner who could. Owner, who could not the mineral rights. Owner. Right. And as a surface owner, the Dormant Mineral Interest Act will not give you relief in that case because that mineral interest owner knows they own the interest, have, have engaged in use during the period of time, and have actually entered into a lease. So, so you aren't going to be able to attempt to get those mineral rights under the Act. And is there any way I can protect myself though, now and in the future that would ruin my drinking water? No. The answer is yes. Uh, you have to look into that, but that's beyond the scope of our talk for this evening. Yes, in the back. What was the main reason for this act anyhow? I mean, uh, every, everything's dormant or, or not used, whether it be land or minerals. Um, is this basically to spur taxes from the state or to stop fraudulent claims by gas companies? Well, what is the primary point of this whole thing? Um, his question is, is the purpose of this act um, for the state to gain taxes or to prevent the oil companies from being fraudulent? Um, he wants to know why this act was um, brought before the legislature. Am I, did I interpret that correctly? The, the legislative intent behind the act was to provide a way for surface owners to be able to resolve questions of mineral interest ownership where those mineral interest owners for the most part couldn't be ascertained or couldn't be found. Um, that's kind of an oversimplification. Uh, but when you talk about mineral, when you talk about surface owners who are trying to resolve <coughs> questions of title of mineral interest or even mineral interest owners who are trying to resolve questions of title, uh, the need for this act became apparent because there wasn't uh, the way to locate every missing heir, there wasn't a way to locate every uh, owner that was uh, owning a half interest that was severed in 1903. Um, simply the records in, in the intervening years are sometimes inadequate to be able to do that. So this is a statutory solution to that problem. I'm sorry. Ten percent of the people aren't going to be able to do what in time? Now you're, you want to repeat that? Well, the question is that only about 10% of the landowners will know about this statute, and um, you know, how, how are they going to know in order to file? Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, there's 90% or 98% wouldn't know anything about this. And this, you know, this brings into, fortunately, maybe these gas companies could claim 
can't really ship up. Now, it just seems like it's kind of a detrimental situation. I don't know what to repeat out of that. I, no, I, 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 I will say that gas companies can't come in and fraudulently get these mineral interests because the party who is able to file this kind of action is the surface owner. So unless the gas company has gone and purchased the surface of attractive land, they don't have standing to bring this kind of an action. So they won't be able to go about acquiring mineral interests by virtue of this act. Um, the underlying tenor of your question really, though, is one of constitutionality. Uh, the idea that uh, a property ownership can, can, be, can be taken or, or, or can be subsumed by a, a statute uh, is unconstitutional. Well, this is a uniform act and it's in place in many other states uh, in various forms other than Maryland. Um, West Virginia has a similar act. Pennsylvania has an act that is specifically about oil and gas that's a little bit different but serves the same purpose. And those other statutes have survived challenges based upon constitutionality. So given that Maryland is kind of late to the game in adopting this act, <clears throat> we believe that it would survive, well, I believe that it would survive a constitutional challenge in its current form. But, but that may occur. There may be a constitutional challenge. Oh. All the way in the back? Sorry. Um, just to make sure I understand this, this is still useful even if your title shows, your mineral search shows who the owner is. You can still file under this if the minerals have been dormant, if there's been no activity on that reservation. Right. If you don't have, if that doesn't have to be a case of an unknown owner. The question is, she knows that who, who the owner of the mineral rights is, but they have not, they've been inactive for the 20 years. Can she still file even though the um, mineral rights owner is known? And the answer is yes, because you may know who that owner is, but you can't find a way to contact them for some reason or... Okay. This is the second time this question has come up. Who contacts the mineral rights owner once you have filed to regain those rights? The surface owner has an obligation to attempt to locate them, and the trustee also has an obligation to attempt to locate them. So uh, throughout the, the, the course of the litigation, those attempts would be made. So once you file, the trust is not set up, I'm assuming, until an attempt has been made to contact owner of the right okay. it, the trust is set up to preserve the interests of that sort of unknown or uncontactable person what is the cost of setting up this trust the, these cases are going to be somewhat unique on a case-by-case -case basis so it's very difficult to say in general it's going to cost X when we do mineral searches even, it's very difficult. We, we might have one that's very easy and one that takes about three days of solid research. But it, it's actually the, the state that's setting up the trust, right? I mean, it, it's... It's the court. The court. Generally speaking, I would think that that would be a specific fee that your attorney, that you would be liable to pay. Yes. So, and I don't think that particular fee would vary. Maybe your attorney's fees to get the whole process Typically, the trustees' fees are, are those considered to be reasonable trustees' fees. And, you know, reasonable, again, depends upon the complexity of the responsibility of the trustee in that particular case. Is there one unknown person? Is there ten unknown persons? Does the uh, surface owner get any notice of in, if somebody filed the intent to use as a mineral owner? The, the surface owner gets constructive notice when it's filed in the land records. Nobody mails one to your house. So if you're the surface owner, you're going to want to check from time to time those land records to see if there's been a notice filed. 
As a practical matter, the statute provides that the action of the surface owner cannot be filed until after October 1st, 2011. So really what's going to happen is that folks that are going to file their notices are prudently going to do that before October 1st, 2011. Those surface owners who want to file this kind of action will first want to check the land records after October 1st, 2011, and certainly immediately prior to the time that they file their cause of action to make sure there hasn't been a notice filed in the land records at that time. The question is, what if a company had the mineral rights more than 100 years ago and the company is no longer in existence? Those are frankly some of the most difficult cases to resolve because um, a corporation or, or a partnership is, is a separate legal person, is a separate entity, and if there's not records filed with the state of Maryland, with the State Department of Assessment and Taxation, uh, or other records found in the, in the land records through other ownership, assessment records, taxation records. There's really not a good way to track that information down. If there is a copy of the Articles of Incorporation with the State of Maryland, or if they were filed among the land records, which was done in some early cases, you might be able to locate the names of some of the uh, incorporators or some of the directors or officers. Uh, but if it's a very old company, that information may not be useful at all. So that's, that's a unique case and a case where very often this Dormant Mineral Interest Act is going to be of benefit. Yes? Chris, is it prudent for uh, the owner of no rights who has a current gas lease to uh, file the notice of intent to maintain those rights because there's been that recent activity is it a new point? If you have a, a current, a recent, let me repeat okay. the question. If you have been active with your gas rights, do you need, still need to file this um, intent? That current lease that you've entered into, so long as it is recorded among the land records, uh, would serve as sufficient use, so you would not have to file the notice. Now, you'd want to be careful of two things. Number one, you'd want to be careful that there was a copy of the lease or a memorandum of lease actually filed in the land records. So that's actually done. And you also want to make sure that that lease encompasses all of the interests that you own. So if there's a gas lease, that's a use for gas. But if you also own the coal rights, you know, do you need to file a notice of intent with respect to the coal portion of your interest versus the gas lease? So you want to take a look at that on a case by case basis for sure. Yes. On a tract of land that you uh, withheld the coal rights very specifically set out, nothing was said about the gas rights. Now, who would own the gas rights? If the reservation is specifically for coal rights, then all the other minerals, gas, oil, uh, limestone, whatever else that may be, continues to travel forward with the surface in the chain of title. Does that answer your question? I had an attorney, Mr. Stover, to search my And uh, my parents sold off 142 acres of the state of Maryland. I think that it says underlying stuff. I'm sure that. But Mr. Stover, he said, you own that. Our first deed was in three cents. We did it the state, they didn't put that in. He says that clause is a magic word that is able to hold. Is that be true or not? The question, I'll repeat it. <laughs> um, the question is again about whether or not when just the coal rights were reserved, 
do all of the other mineral rights convey with the deed going forward. And um, Attorney Stover had told his family that the term fee simple is, is how the, the, this was kept with the coal rights. You're really kind of asking me a question about specific wording in your deed. And so it's hard for me to answer that question. But the general answer to the question is, if there's a reservation that is uh, specific, not simply all minerals, but specific to coal, then the only thing that's reserved out is that coal and all the other minerals go forward with the surface until there is coal gas. Yes. Yes. In the back. is about the definition of intent your question is one of, of um, if there is a reservation of a mineral and then there's some additional language that needs to be interpreted with respect to intent uh, does this act or does Maryland law provide a clarification for that based upon the definition of the mineral substance and the answer is really no um, if you know if your deed has very simple language I reserve the coal there's not really a lot of interpretation with respect to what was reserved. But deeds used all kinds of interesting language. And the more creative people got, or the more particular they tried to make their reservations, the more this idea of interpreting what the parties really meant <clears throat> becomes a problem. And specifically, again, what was the letter that you were referring to? I was referring to a letter that was written at the request of uh, Senator Edwards. And it was written by, I'll give you the gentleman's name. It was written by Robert N. McDonald, who's the chief counsel in the attorney general's office. And that letter was written to Senator Edwards in response to the senator's questions. Uh, he had several questions, one of which is, what is the definition of minerals? What, what is included in the term minerals under Maryland law? What he said is that minerals or mineral rights in a deed of conveyance will be interpreted to include all inorganic substances that can be taken from the land, including oil and natural gas. Because you'll recall the question was, do minerals include gas, was really the question. Um, he says, however, if evidence shows the grantor and the grantee intended a different or more restrictive meaning, that meaning will prevail the term mineral rights, what is included and what is excluded, ultimately depends on the intent of the parties to the deed or the conveyance at issue. So if there is some wording that in, you know, would lead you to believe that it was just the coal that they had intended at the time to reserve, then that has gone through court cases and, and legally you could? There is some precedent with respect to coal. Um, Really, the underlying question is, if you look at your deed and you've got a lot of funny language in your deed, and when you look at it, you don't really know what it means, chances are it's subject to some interpretation. Say you uh, get through and get this trust in it. Now, you can, you can lease the gas and you get the revenue while it's in the trust. Can't. Can you sign a lease for your gas while the rights are still in trust? Right. The, the act contemplates that the trust is created to protect the rights of those people that are either missing or, or cannot be ascertained. 
um, or have not come forward. So if you, if you know you own half the rights and this unknown person owns the other half, the trust is created for that other half and the gas can be leased, but the proceeds for that half for the owner who has yet to be found will be held in trust subject to that person's right to come forward, if any. And at the end of the five-year period, if the surface owner then receives ownership of that one-half interest, they would also then receive the proceeds out of the trust as well. So Chris, that might answer a question of mine, if I may. So I can file for half an interest? Yes. In fact, you're going to see a large proportion of cases where that, that exists. Um, for some reason, back in the day, the idea of reserving one half of certain mineral interests was very popular. And so we see a lot of individuals who own a half of the mineral interest under their surface but have no idea where the other half might be. What about if I have no interest there? Well, well, if you have no interest and you don't know where any of these other mineral owners are, then you file this action as a surface owner. Yeah, but can, in the meantime, can I file a lease? In the meantime, if a trust is created, the trustee After can. The yeah, the trust. The trustee can participate in that effort. Yeah, yeah. The nice thing about this act is that it does not delay the possibility of entering into a lease or, or doing taking other action with the property uh, during the pendency of the five-year period. Yes? Uh, can this or any other form of extraction be conducted <coughs> under Deep Creek Lake or the watershed area? <laughs> now that question is really outside of the scope of tonight's topic. Yeah, um, <laughs> and and uh, I can't answer that question. I don't have the appropriate degrees to, to be able to give you an opinion on that. Yes. Um, I just wanted to clarify what you said. Are, are you recommending that any landowner who thinks, anyway, they own both their surface and mineral rights, that it would be wise to check the land records after October 1st? It's not a bad idea. Um, there may be someone who mistakenly believes that they have some claim of ownership of the minerals under your property. Um, if they've filed a notice uh, in the land records, you have constructive notice of that fact. And so um, confirming that there hasn't been any notice filed for your particular property would, would be a, a good idea. Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Gary. How are those notices filed regarding the parcels that may exist now versus how they may have existed in the past? That's a real challenge for description, quite frankly. Um, when you do the mineral title search, hopefully you will come to the instrument that properly describes that mineral interest and identify it that way. Uh, part of the challenge of bringing that chain of title forward is to try to determine uh, the current owners of that surface w as it relates to the mineral interest. So yeah, that's a big challenge and, and it's going to keep lawyers very busy, but it's also going to have surveyors busy a little bit too because sometimes you simply can't define that without plotting it. Jim? Uh, on the percentage part of 50% uh, ownership of the minerals, does it ever get broken down to two-thirds, one-third, or um, in a situation like that, the, the majority of it it can be broken down into as many fractional shares as there might be heirs of John Doe. Um, in the case where you can find some of the heirs and not all of the heirs, uh, under, under this act, the surface owner could theoretically eventually get ownership of a two-sevenths ownership while the other five-sevenths ownership is rightfully claimed by the mineral owners. So yeah, you can definitely have fractional ownership with different results. Yes, in the back. How far back do you research to find heirs?
So how far back do you research? Yeah, well, I'm not so much how far back research, but how far would like their grandchildren, their <coughs> grandchildren be entitled to that, or just, just children, or just so that that half? So, so your question is how far can they pass the, 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 the rights on? If the mineral interest was severed in 1903 and then nothing was done with it and it's, it's stuck in the John Smith estate uh, when John Smith died, then however many generations have occurred in their intervening years, all of those heirs theoretically could have an ownership interest in that. So you have to go back and, and, and sort of research how that uh, property would have been um, conveyed forward through the, through the estates and through the heirs. It, it's, it's a really daunting process in some cases and the inability to find people or the inability to ascertain how many children uh, were born of one of the heirs in the second generation uh, can't always be answered and that's why this act is useful. <coughs> Once the paper's filed, where is it mailed to, and then what happens? If you're talking about the notice, then it's filed in the land records. The, the, the notice that's filed by mineral interest owners is filed in the land records. If you're talking about the legal action that the surface owner would undertake, then it's served upon all the interested parties. Let me get Jim and then I'll come back to the back. Is there a fee for filing? <clears throat> yeah, the, the fee for filing would be the same fee for filing any lawsuit in the circuit court. So there's a, there's a fee for filing that action um, with the court and then whatever legal fees may be associated with actually preparing the petition and filing it. So, and the gentleman in the back. Will there be simple forms that an individual can fill out themselves without having to have an attorney involved? No one has created a standard form and there's no form that's set forth in the, in the act. The act says what must be in the notice, in other words, what the content of the notice must be, but there's not a form that's set out in statute or at this time in the rules uh, to affect the notice. So you can do the notice yourself if you meet all the requirements under the act for the notice and if you can properly define the interest and the legal description with respect to the interest yourself. So you don't have to have an attorney do it, you just need to be pretty certain you're doing it right if you do it yourself. Okay, are there any further questions? Chris, I'm not sure you He doesn't think you can do it just quite that simply. If it doesn't meet, if the document itself does not meet the legal requirements, the clerk can refuse to record the document, yes. There's a book about that thick that has them all in. <laughs> Well, thank you very much all for, for coming out, for, for putting up with my cold symptoms along the way and my uh, under the influence delivery here with this cold medication and, and also for coming out on a night when the snow is uh, maybe going to get the better of some of us. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate your time. Um, again, if I, my apologies if you did not receive the handout. They will be available tomorrow at marcellashale.garrettcounty.org. Thank you. You're doing all right? You're doing good. Feeling better? Yep. Really? <laughs> Never felt bad. That was a problem. <laughs> I know. Never can relate to that. Felt worse after laying on my back three days in the hospital, tied up till I couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> Thank you. But I really am fine. All the tests came out. <laughs> Good, and so there's no more damage. I got damage, a one, so. 377th 
share of a gas well in Spencer, West Virginia. Well, then you're going to need a West Virginia attorney. <laughs> I took it a couple years ago and sent it back to an uncle in Ohio and says, keep this damn thing, it ain't no good to me. That's what a lot of people have done with some very small interest. Yeah, yeah. it started in 1874 or something like that. That can happen. There's no question about it. People keep having kids. I want to introduce myself. I'm Katie Deller. Yes. Yes. Time you talk to me, it's done okay. with the name. I just yeah. want to introduce myself. Oh, it's nice to see you first here. here. I yeah. won't shake your hand so I don't spread germs. But I have kids. I don't want to spread germs <laughs> well, anymore. Very good. But nice presentation. Thank you. Very good job. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. I've got a different situation here, and I didn't want to bring it up. Hello, I'm going home. Oh, okay. Come right. on, right. See you later. Okay. See you. Chris, thank you very much. Oh, I'm going to not share my call. Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but thank thanks. you very much. Thanks for the education. Oh, no problem. I can't see how you can shake my head. <laughs> I don't want to share it with anybody. I can't see how you can keep your head together. Oh, I, I'm you know all the things <laughs> I, I'm a person that doesn't do very well on cold medicine, so I was really nervous, but I couldn't breathe any other way. Oh, you've done a fantastic job. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm in a fog as a result. So, okay, so see, there's four different fans, four different uh, people bought these mineral rights years ago, and now they're all deceased. And if there's 15 different heirs, do we what? Just to what do we do? We have to do? Can you fix it up for us? Does each individual of those 15 have to come in? To do this, or can one person go and have this done? Who owns the surface? Do you know that? Carrie. Okay. And then, um, so yeah, I think it's Carrie. So, so you're you're saying, what do all the mineral interest owners need to do? Yes. These these fifteen folks need to sort of band together. That's that's what makes the most sense because that way together they can engage in one mineral search and. Um, file the notice of intent together. They don't have to if they won't all cooperate, but that would be the better way to handle it. Oh, we'll get together so can we get... Chris, I don't want to yeah. interrupt you. This oh. was a very thorough job. I oh, you did thank you. I a great job of going through a very complicated topic. It's, it's, it's a little hard to thing. break it down into... Some of us in Allegheny are exchange lawyers, exchanging comments about possible suggested amendments. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? It's John Coyle and myself. And so let me get in contact with you and see if you want to okay, participate. Okay, Bob. Yeah, I would. Exchange. Yeah, sure. Because okay. there's some shortcomings in it. There's no doubt. Yeah, there are a couple of things that you know like you say that might you know, actually improve how you can answer them. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd be happy anyway, to be part of that. Job. Thanks, Bob. I just wanted to tell you you've gotten better with age. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You really helped me. <laughs> Preston Countyans, but it helped us too. Well, thank you Thanks. very much. Stop, Chris. Well, thank you. I need to get with you. I'll shoot you an email, maybe get on your calendar. Yeah, that sounds there's good. There's a couple issues with both places, both properties I have. Okay. On both sides of the both both sides, sides of the scale, I'm yeah. pretty sure well, I have mineral rights and then where I don't. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there's a number of people that are kind of in that situation. So I figure I better get in queue. Huh? Yep, that's exactly <laughs> right. You're going to be a busy girl. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better. Thank you very much. You did a real good job. Oh, thank you, Barry. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Um, yeah, I would. I mean, I'm not suggesting they're all going to cooperate, and if they don't, I think they will. Work. They will. It's, okay. I, I really do think. They yeah, work. not each fact, of the unless they're unless for some reason there's something about their ownership that makes them adverse to one another. There's no reason why one attorney couldn't represent all 15 people to undertake the file, the search and the filing of the notice. So. Well, see, they, they, a couple of them come to me and said, "You take care of this and take." take care for the whole group? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Not right now. Well, <laughs> you would only want to do that if it was properly documented because you have to have actual authority to be able to do that. From all 15? From all 15. But we could accomplish that. The, each of the 15 individuals could sign a limited power of attorney designating you for the purpose of doing this. Just like I could designate you as a limited power of attorney person to sell my property because I was out of town. You'd have a specific set of legal rights that allowed you to act for me to undertake that transaction. And the same could be done in this case. And that way you'd have actual authority to be able to file on behalf and, and, and deal with me or another attorney on behalf of all these folks. So if we'd come in and say that all 15 of us agree to do this here, to file whatever we need to file, 
to preserve these mineral rights. Because see, they're, they're getting ready to dig coal, and that's what okay. this is about. Yeah. And we come in and say, here, Chris, here's we all 15 of us are, have their names, addresses, or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're all agreed to do this and let you do it and you can take care of it. Yep. And I know what the next question is going to be asked me. Can you tell me roughly what it might 